Good evening, everyone. My name is Ben Vanderweide with Oakland Township Parks and Recreation. I'm the Natural Area Stewardship Manager. So if you're not familiar with our park system, we have about 1,500 acres of uh, parkland. Um, and if you don't know about our Natural Area Stewardship website, um, Cam Benito in the back there writes a blog for us. And uh, it's all nature um, oriented. So she talks about the work that we're doing in the parks and often her observations of what she's seen in the park. So a great way to learn more about our natural areas. And we uh, came actually gave a talk um, two weeks ago and the recording is now available on YouTube. So if you just search for Cam Menino and the title of her talk, it'll pop right up. And with that, I'd like to introduce Joe Bruce, our speaker for this evening. So he's the conservation chair with the Vanguard chapter of Trout Unlimited. Um, Joe is a real go-getter from the couple of months that I've known him. So he uh, sent me an email, introduced himself, and then set up a meeting. And we talked all about Paint Creek, and I could immediately tell he was very passionate about the creek, about the trout in the stream, about the restoration work. Um, and this is the, the type of people that our community runs on. Uh, we try not to lean on him too hard, because I can tell Joe does more than his fair share of, uh, of work to protect our community. So I hope this will be a great spark for all of us to come together and continue to protect this amazing gem in our community. Okay, great. Thank I'll you. And to this, I'm going to do some technology stuff. Is oh yeah, yeah, you're going to um yeah, you can get your screen up. Sorry. Yeah, bring my screen up. Uh, thanks for coming tonight and braving the weather. Um, I appreciate it. I, Joe Bruce, as he said, I live in Rochester Hills. I've been in Rochester Hills for over 25 years. Um, I retired a few years ago, uh, and it provided me the opportunity to go maybe back to my undergraduate roots. I was a fishery and aquatic biology major and actually did that for several years. That's what brought me to Michigan, working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and then um, decided to uh, transition and got an MBA from Michigan and worked in business. Always though, with in the back of my mind, what can I do to help the environment in every business decision I ever made? So um, this has been great. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about Trout Unlimited and the work we're doing on this very unique resource here in Southeast Lower Michigan called Paint Creek. And that's just one of my favorite pictures of Paint Creek, just out doing, taking pictures. Um, ben, that's working. It's there's something in this here. Thing. Sometimes you gotta click on this again. Try that. Okay. So, um, since 2016, our Trout Unlimited chapter has been working on a habitat restoration project for the creek, um, and. Um, we are the Vanguard Trout Unlimited Chapter. We're located here uh, in Rochester. And in 2019, we were the Michigan uh, Chapter of the Year. And uh, I like to start with this uh, phrase from the founder of Trout Unlimited. He said, if you take care of the fish, and the fishing will take care of itself. So um, that's what we aim to do. And um, let's learn a little bit about who is Trout Unlimited. Trout Unlimited was formed actually in Grayling, Michigan in 1959 by several fishermen up there who wanted to um, do work to, to maintain and improve the Asabo River. Uh, so it's grown into a, a national nonprofit organization uh, and its focus is uh, conserving, protecting, and restoring America's cold water fisheries and their uh, watersheds. Um, Every chapter in Trout Unlimited has what we call a home water, where the chapter focuses on doing conservation work in that stream or river. And uh, Vanguard's home water is the Paint Creek. And uh, most members are avid fly fishermen. So it kind of goes hand in hand with the, the hobby and the passion for cold water fisheries. What is uh, Trout Unlimited's approach to addressing these issues? Because there, these cold water um, habitat issues, preservation things, um, all have uh, come from different perspectives. 
Have you ever heard the expression, the tragedy of the commons? You guys familiar with that? It kind of says, when everybody owns it, everybody assumes somebody else is taking care of it. Okay. And you see some of that, especially in the natural resources, parks, and common areas where, you know, somebody must be taking care of this. It must be somebody else's job. And because to use approaches, each chapter has a home water, we take it upon ourselves to make it kind of our responsibility. So knowing this, the local chapters of Trout Unlimit make it their mission to bring all the interested and knowledgeable parties together. One person can't fix many of these things that we're facing. Um, share relevant information. There's different parties working on different things. And even on the Paint Creek, there's the DNR, there's the Fish and Wildlife Service, there's um, Crillington River Watershed Council, there's Trout Unlimited, and everybody's kind of working on these different things. Um, so we try and share information to optimize and not double up what we're doing. And together with knowledgeable people, we mutually determine where the problem areas are so we can optimize our work. Uh, we pull together project permitting and funding because these projects, if you're doing any kind of project in water, you have to get EGLE permission to do that work in the state of Michigan or anywhere. Um, and then we get everybody working together to make permanent long-term improvements to cold water rivers and streams. So we try and be a neutral party, know who's doing what where, bring everybody together and put together a solid project to improve um, whatever, for in our case, um, paint creep. Oh, and as I speak, if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. I want to answer questions as I go rather than try and circle back to um, um, slides and things. So that's our approach to addressing these issues. It's a, um, we all work together. I'm going to start my presentation, though, with a story about Gallagher Creek. Do you guys know Gallagher Creek? OK, um, you know the expression, um, the canary in the coal mine? You know what that means? Everybody knows what that means? Gallagher Creek could be a little bit of the canary in the coal mine for Paint Creek. It runs into Paint Creek right behind the cider mill here. It's headwater, or if you follow it up, it runs near a golf course and several subdivisions. Here's a summary of the DNR's fish studies on um, 47 years of fish studies on Gallagher Creek done by the DNR. I pulled this out of one of their reports. In 1968, and they normalized the data, there was over a thousand brook trout per mile in Gallagher Creek. In over 47 years, in 2015, there's none. This naturally producing brook trout population is probably gone forever. And brook trout are very sensitive, um, uh, more than, than the brown trout that we have in, in Paint Creek. So think about this. Over 47 years, nobody saw the change, right? If you look out your back window and see the creek or something, you don't see changes that occur over 47 years. So that's why we have to, it's important to stay on top of these things. Question. Yes. So uh, it, it, the brook trout population is down. It's We're gone. In, gone yeah. Have they been supplanted by um, brown trout or are there no brown trout either? They're a small stream species of trout. You probably wouldn't have brown trout up there. Occasionally one might find its way up, but I can tell you, even if you look at where Gallagher Creek comes into Paint Creek. There's a big cement um, culvert that I don't even think, unless it's super high water, nothing's going to go up to the culvert. Scott, Scott, another member of the chapter, has a lot of history on this. You got any comments on that, Scott? Or well, I don't think there's any fish passage there right now at all. But they like cool water, small streams. Um, it's gone, and to restore it, you'd have to go back, check out the habitat. It, it, it's 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 not going to happen, not easily. But we do have this unique resource here called Paint Creek, okay? It's in really good shape. Could be better, but it's in really good shape. 
Let's talk a little bit about Paint Creek and I'll give you some history of, of Paint Creek and what it's what it's like. So the DNR classifies Paint Creek as a coal transitional stream. And it's one of the few coal transitional streams in Southeast Lower Michigan, okay? So it's, it's good, it's cold water. It's not premier, but it's pretty good for this area. It's unique because it's headwater dam has a bottom draw tube. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. In the summer, cooler water from the bottom of Lake Orion can be released into the creek. This helps keep Paint Creek's water cool for trout. You ever jumped into a pond and the top is nice and warm and as you go down, it's cold? That's why there's a bottom draw pipe on the dam. It's taking that bottom cold water from the bottom of Lake Orion and, and putting it into the Paint Creek. Also, I, I should have put it on here. There are a lot of uh, groundwater, cool groundwater springs and things along Paint Creek that also help keep it cool, cooler than a lot of the other water in this area. And every year, Michigan DNR stocks Paint Creek with up to 5,000 brown trout. They go in at about five inches, five to six inches. Uh, I'm going to get to that, but if the creek gets over 68 degrees, it starts to stress the brown trout. Stress. And at 70, you don't want to fish them because they'll overtax themselves. And even if you put them back, the chances of them surviving are reduced as the temperature gets warmer. That should stay below 68. We, we like it below 68 is, I mean, people might say different things, but 68, I would say. So I, there's a, and I don't have it in my presentation. Um, there's a monitoring site in the creek down in uh, Rochester Park. And there's a website you can go out there and, and see the temperature of the creek. Yeah, we have a link on our website also where you can go right to that um, that monitoring device and it'll give you the um, stream flow. Stream, well, stream flow, it tells you how high it is. You know, it doesn't get the cubic feet? Not anymore. And the reason for that is, is that the government entity that ran the high fancy monitoring of Paint Creek wanted, was it 10 or $15,000 a year to maintain that site? And we don't, we don't have that kind of, people don't have that kind of money, right? And so what we did was um, Trout Unlimited, the state office went and found the solution for like a hundred, maybe it's a couple hundred dollars a year where it works off a cell phone and some monitors in the creek. So for a couple hundred dollars a year and, and Clinton River Watershed Council, and maybe Clinton Valley put some money into that too. Um, so for a few hundred dollars versus $15,000, we get basic temperature and height. Ultimately, you could calculate from height into flow, but you know it takes people to do that. Anyway, sorry, but it, this is, it, so 5,000 brown trout annually. And I always say, why travel three hours north when you can fly fish right here? Here's the dam up at Lake Orion, if you've never seen it, and I believe, the bottom draw pipe is here and it comes in right there. Um, so that's the headwater. Now this is an important slide here. This is uh, from the DNR and this is the Clinton River watershed. That means all the creeks and rivers that flow into the Clinton River. If you look at this, they have it labeled as warm water, warm water and blue cold water. There's only one cold water stream in the Clinton River watershed. That's Paint Creek. It's unique. And it's a combination of the water from the bottom draw tube. It's a combination of the shade along the creek. It's a combination of the, the springs that flow into it. And that's what allows us to have a brown trout fishing resource in Paint Creek because the temperature generally stays below 68 degrees because of all those factors. What's that? Are you going with all of those things? 
Oh, I, I don't, I couldn't answer that question. I think my impression is this is kind of unique. I th There might have been some out farther, but can you answer that? I Have you ever seen a parking lot after it rains and the steam coming off it? Where do you think that water's going? A lot in in places where they they are grandfathered in, it's running right off into the creek. So they don't they don't allow that anymore. Uh, stormwater management will requires you to keep that water retained but prior to those regulations that's what often happens and there there are some parking lots along paint creek that run right into the creek so um paint creek is a, from lake orion to to the clinton river is about 15 miles um and everybody recognizes the roads and locations and everything right there just a little orientation it runs through Lake Orion, Oakland Township, Rochester Hills, and Rochester. Again, let's not let the tragedy of the commons impact making sure we're all aware of what's going on in Paint Creek. And I think we are, but it takes constant reminders as people change and turnover and stuff. Um, if you walk the creek or bike along the trail, it's a 250 foot elevation change between um, downtown Rochester and the uh, dam. So if you're going north and it's a little harder than when you're going south, there's the reason why. So in 2016, um, the Michigan Trout Unlimited organization got a grant from DTE Energy to do a habitat study on that entire 15 mile section of paint creek where is good habitat for trout where is it missing and kristen thomas was the primary author of that and again you're going to hear her name quite a bit um she put this report together with a bunch of summer interns and her boss um ryan burrows who who was the the director of michigan trout unlimited put this together um and it, it's meant to be a guide for what could or should be done to restore areas that are now kind of degrading, not so good. Over time, these things happen. In 2017, Vanguard's Conservation Committee got a hold of the report, reviewed it, and said, what a great um, uh, roadmap for us to use in our home water. So we took this report and contacted Kristen, contacted a bunch of people and said, let's make this our roadmap for the next few years. So with chapter board approval, we put together a multi-year action plan and away we went. What problems were identified in the report? Um, here's a picture. Uh, this was actually phase three that we just did. Uh, a lack of in-stream wood structures. The fish like to hide in the cracks and crevices and things. There's no place for them to hide from predators or places for them to seek shelter during high water flows. If you've seen some of the hundred year floods we've had in the past year, when those things come through, if the fish don't have a place to hide, and I'll talk about that in some future slides, they get flushed down to the Clinton River. They get flushed right out of the creek. Um, bank erosion. Bank erosion is a big issue. And you can see pictures here of trees and just their roots. And eventually these trees will collapse and die and that eliminates the shade that provides and helps keep the, the creek cool. And you don't notice erosion, right? Oh yeah, I saw it. That's eh, the same as it was last year, but it's not, it's not. And then, Banks with no deep rooted native plants or shrubs. When people cut the grass down to the edge of the creek, um, it tends to erode faster, which re results in a wider 
shallower creek. Now, what what do we what does that mean? You know, what what's the big deal? Well, I'm going to give you a little um, show and tell here. Okay. So here's the creek, right? What happens when the banks erode? Get shallower. When it gets shallower, there's less place for the fish to go. It gets warmer because it's not as deep and it's not good habitat for the trout. But if we can find ways to naturally rebuild the banks, what happens to the creek? It gets better, it gets deeper. So I want you, I'm gonna bring this out a couple times as we show you some of the stuff that we do, but think about that. The creek is here, over time it erodes, it erodes, it erodes, it erodes. And then if it's a, a real low rain summer, there's barely any water in certain sections where the creek flows. So I'll bring that out again. So we put together our team, phase one. We're really a bunch of rookies. We're trying to figure out what's right for Paint Creek. How do we do this? How much is it going to cost? When can we do it? What's the permitting? So the Trout and our Vanguard, we have an executive or a conservation committee. I'm chairman, but I couldn't do anything without the help of all these guys there. And several of them are in the room here. So thanks for coming, guys. Um, Kristen, who wrote the report, she jumped right in and helped us. She was glad somebody picked it up and said, they're really going to use this. You know, there's so many scientific reports that get written and don't get used, which is part of the reason I left the actual research of fishery and aquatic biology, because you're doing work and you say, I don't know if this will ever get used. Um, we use a professional uh, stream restoration consultant, Aaron Snell. His company is Streamside Ecological Services. He does this kind of work for a living. He knows and he knows people at Eagle and the DNR. They know him. He's a trusted contact. So he helped us with the permitting because we we could never figure that out and who to file it with and all that other stuff. Um, and then Michigan DNR, Cleo Harris is our regional fishery biologist. And the way the DNR sets up responsibilities is Cleo's responsibility is the Clinton River watershed. They don't do it by county or by city. They do it by watershed. So uh, Cleo's watershed is the Clinton River watershed. So he's very interested in people who are doing work in the watershed. So this was kind of our key members. So we started off in 2017 doing phase one and phase two. And some of these pictures of phase one and phase two aren't that good because we were too busy trying to figure out what to do with the logs and what to do. So we weren't taking pictures. I got better pictures of the, the more recent work. But um, so the first phase one and phase two we did below Tinkin Road. It went from Tinkin Road down to the bottom of Dinosaur Hill, okay? Um, and we did that over several years. So to make this happen, you have to get local consent. So we had to get permission from Dinosaur Hill to do the work, City of Rochester, Rochester Hills, Paint Creek Trailways Commission, and private landowners. So we have to solicit and get written sign off to be allowed to do that work before we can even submit our, our permit. So then you have to go to Eagle and DNR to get the permit, which can be up to a six month process. Uh, they know us now. Our last permit happened pretty quickly, like in two or three months, because they, they know us, they trust us. And uh, we have to do follow up reports every time we, for three years after we do something. So we send them the follow up reports so they know we're staying on top of it. Um, so first we did a site visit with Kristen from TU, uh, Aaron from Streamside and, and Cleo from Michigan DNR. We all got buy-in that this site makes sense. It can use improvement. Here's some ideas what we think we can do. Um, then we prepared the application, Aaron did that. Uh, and we have to actually map out where we're gonna put the structures. Uh, and then our time for doing the work is somewhat limited because in the spring you get high water. You can't really do a when it's really high water and you guys have all seen it, you can't do work. And then in the fall, you're restricted by law from doing work because it's spawning season. So you have to fit it in in the summer. 
And then, as I said, after completion, EGLE requires us to do follow-up reports for two years, assuring them that the structures are in place and doing what we designed to do, what they were designed to do. And then we have to find the funding. So um, for phase one and phase two, we got money from Trout Unlimited. They have a grant program, so we filed a grant application there. And that year, we also got a, a, an Orvis match for that money. Uh, Michigan Fly Fishing Club, uh, they gave us two grants. Clinton Valley gave us a grant, and then we raised our own money. So the total cost for phase one and phase two was about $14,000 plus several hundred volunteer hours. Okay. And um, you're going to see that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. So here's our site plans. So here's phase one when we were rookies trying to figure this out, and we mapped out 15 uh, locations where we could put the structures. And if you've walked Dinosaur Hill, there's the footbridge that goes across in Dinosaur Hill to either side. So you can get a reference there. And then in phase two, we're feeling a little bit more confident. So we put in 26 structures. Okay. Again, you have to map it all out, show them where you're gonna where you're gonna do it. So what habitat structures were installed? There were two primary structures. One was we they're called veins. And the other one is just an in-stream log. And I'll show you pictures of both of those. So what are veins? Veins are structures that increase the water's velocity and redirect the flow to the center of the stream. So this is a vein here. One end is built into the bank. The other end is pointed upstream at about a 30 degree angle. And they are a natural restoration technique used to improve the habitat and prevent bank erosion. And I'll explain that more in the next slide. So you'll see these, if you, if you walk through Dinosaur Hill, you'll see these in action. You might just think they're, they're naturally there, but they're our work. And the whole point is to make it look like it's naturally there. So how do veins impact the stream? They modify flow direction away from the stream banks. So here, this is an example with rocks. You can make them out of rocks too, but if this were a log, you can see as the stream comes down, it's, it has to be, it's critical to be tw between 20 and 30 degrees upstream. And Aaron, who's done this kind of looks at it and says, okay, that's about 30 degrees or 20, depending upon the angle. Um, uh, for the structure to work properly, it needs to be built into the bank in the downstream direction. See down here? Because you don't want water flowing around it because it'll erode the bank. So that has to be really, I mean, we dig out the bank sometimes and shove the log into the bank to make, and then put all rocks around it. That's like the critical point. And that's one of the reasons we do the follow-up reports to make sure that that's in place. And the hydrology, the science behind it is when the water hits the vein, it takes a 90 degree turn and gets pointed back into the center of the creek. So what happens then is a couple things. First, it starts forming what they call a scour pool because the water is all funneled over the creek in a certain direction. It starts digging a little deeper hole behind the log, which is a great place for fish to hide. And you'll see pictures. It's also bubbly and things on top. So if the fish are in there, Predators can't see them. And then in a high water, and you can go and put your hand down under that log, it's perfectly calm. So the fish can go hide behind the logs in high water, and the, it just runs, flows, and when the water goes down, they go back to their business again. So, um, and the really big thing is because this happens, this push into the center, there's deposition of soil on the upstream and downstream side of the vein that rebuilds the banks. Any questions on this? This is, it's amazing. I got some pictures, you, you'll, you'll be amazed. What's that? Oh yeah. <laughs> so um, in 2019, we did phase one. 
Now, I said we were rookies and we were like, OK, we need some logs. So Aaron went out to a friend of his farm and cut down a bunch of pine trees and hauled them down from up near Lansing. So we had to unload the logs, put them in the creek, float them to where we wanted them. But we just we were learning. Right. And this was some extra cost that we learned that we ultimately didn't need. And I'll show you why. The creek like looked at Ash Creek. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, well, there's our answer. This is the only time we did that. But again, we were we didn't know how many how much was there. Were they the right kind? Were, you know, because you can get some punky stuff that's been laying down on the ground too long and then it you need it so it's solid and becomes a part of the creek bottom. So we wanted to be sure, right? We, we always and I'll show you some other things. We're very, very careful to make sure we're doing this the right way. There's no hack jobs on anything that what what's that do it once do it right yeah. so and we want it to be right so we can continue doing this and we get the right reputation this is not some you know anyway i have expressions but i won't use them <laughs> so as i said in the early days i don't have many pictures but you can see where we were placing this log under a tree where it was eroding the roots, so we want to try and direct the water away from that big tree. Uh, you can see metal rod here barely, but I'll explain that a little bit more in some in the next slide. So we placed what was it, 16 or 18 in the first? In, it was 12, 15. Yeah, in the first in the first one. So there we are working away, kind of normal flow of the stream. Then once the log is, you see it's built into the bank. We put rocks on the upper side because you don't want water to flow under it because it'll erode underneath the the log. So we we put logs in in other places where there's no rocks. We put bush. We cut down an invasive non uh, autumn olive and stuff it behind the the log and things like that. Uh, so that's where we we prep the. And here's a picture of a of a a, a vein after some time. And you can see the flow, the scour pool. And you can look at all the silt that's starting to build up behind the log there. And over time, that silt builds up and builds up and rebuilds the bank. This is an in-stream log, nothing fancy about this. But if you're a fisherman, there is something fancy about this. Notice this foam line going down the center of the creek. There's a fly fishing expression that says foam is home. That's where the trout like to sit because it's a convergence of flow and all their food follows that line. So we put this log right along the uh, foam line and the trout just sit here. Anybody who's a fly fisherman, you're probably dropping a hook right down that, that log right there because that's where the trout are waiting waiting for the food to go by. So we've strategically placed the logs in the stream so it's good for the trout. This is my, I always have a favorite structure that we put in in each section. This is my favorite uh, section. It's a double vein. So we put two veins up. So we're building the bank on this side and on this side, and then we're channeling the water down the center. And that's, Increased, remember I talked about velocity and direction. So we're changing the direction by the water coming here and going this way. And we're building up velocity by pushing all that water to the center that's digging out the bottom of the creek. Remember here? So as that digs it out, it's helping to build the banks in. So um, that's my favorite vein in uh, Dinosaur Hill. Um, you can also see how it kind of works here. There's a, there's a vein here and a vein here. And you can see the leaf build up in the fall because it's kind of a dead calm area. That's good. It's again, all that's building up. So we got phase one done. We're feeling good. So we extended our permit and moved upstream to phase two. And this is um, above Dinosaur Hill. Uh, where all the condos are. 
below Tinkin Road? Now we started figuring out that we could pull logs out of the side of the, the, the creek with permission from the landowners. So this is guys pulling out a big log. Uh, so we didn't have to have Aaron take another day to go cut pine trees and trim them up and bury them in his truck and everything. So now we take all the logs, dead logs or dead trees from along the, the creek. So um, this is, you'll, you'll, you'll see this picture quite a bit. This is our canoe, that's our toolbox. We carry all our stuff along with us in a canoe. The, the sledgehammers, the spikes, the chainsaws, everything. And the, so we have to, on each log, we put two holes, drill a hole through each end at the end of each log. Okay, so that's Aaron drilling holes. Then we put a four foot, three quarter inch steel rod through the log and pound it into the ground, okay, until you don't see this the spike on the log. Now, a lot of people think historically, and when I talk to the Trail Commission, there's some old structures in the creek that have re-rod, you know, which is iron, which is softer, which bends and is not first class. These are steel, all right, and they're expensive, but they don't bend. And we we actually put them in at an angle, so it's holding it up against it. So, and they're done manually. So if you go by just below Tinkin Road, there's a grassy area. And um, this is where we put, this area here was almost pond-like. And you can see the erosion. Is this got a pointer on it that I, oh, anyway, you don't, yeah, give you can that. see, you can see the erosion because they're cutting the bank there. Um, and there used to be rocks along there that, again, helped form the pool. And we took those away so it, it flowed a little better. Um, so uh, I just, you'll see more of this. This is another picture of a, of a vein we put in. And it just shows it, it creates some turbulence, uh, forces the water. This The water was coming down along that. It's a, there's a curve there, and we wanted to push it away from the curve. Uh, this is another vein, and Aaron got artistic and threw a few more logs behind it just to give the fish a place to hide. I still haven't got any fish out of there, but <laughs> the theory was good. Um, yes? Are they, yeah, but you know, guys know what you're doing. They walk them along, or they see a log there. Can you tell that they're man made? No, no, probably not. Yeah, because yeah. probably are they good fishing spots? <laughs> I mean, uh, not that one, not yet, but <laughs> <laughs> but some of them are. Yes, you. I'm not a fisherman, but oh. uh, I'm thinking that eventually these will become good. Exactly. And, uh, that's the tall tail sign or something like that. Yeah, that's that's it exactly. Yeah. Well, that's why I was wondering. Like, but you actually right on top. Like, we don't mark them. We we don't want. We, part of our objective. Part of our objective is to make this look like it just happened. And one of the things, as we do more of this. We found certain areas have, and the DNR does population studies. I'm going to talk about that in a second. There are logs all the time in Paint Creek, but if they're not locked down, they move around. These are not going to move around unless we did something wrong, or it's like a flood and people's houses are going down the creek. Okay, <laughs> so we we make sure these are going to stay in position for a long, long time versus a natural log which could in certain storms just keep tumbling down the creek. You had a question? And do you um, bring in rocks or do you harvest them in, in the skin stream? Everything's from in stream, yeah. Yeah, we're a low budget operation. I looked at buying rocks and that gets expensive and stuff. So, and I feel like regulations on, I mean, a four foot piece of steel, that's pretty impressive to drive that in. I mean, if I were trying to do that, I'd hit a rock. You know, we go through the rock. Yeah, and so when, is there, 
But I mean, if you have this much steel sticking up, no steel sticking up. I guess maybe because of a canoe and over, they just open it right up. No, but, so there's like regulations. You have to have that thing. We just do it because it's the right thing to do. Right. Right. You don't yeah. Down through the rock, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a couple in-stream logs again, kind of in the shade a little bit where they might want to hide out, kind of in the flow. So I'm going to show you some before and after pictures of phase one and phase two. Remember this picture, right? Look at that. Now that's a little bit of a low water time period, but still, look with that. Yeah, you brought it in. Can you flip back again a little bit? Back. Okay, so you don't want to go anywhere. You see how much the uh, vegetation is growing on that already, too, so it's going to hold them. Great. Is that, is that private land yeah, I think it, we, we got permission from the condo association to do the work. I was hoping they'd be here. <laughs> um, so they, I, this is a video. Now, not, as, as we've gotten better at this, I've taken some videos to really describe what's going on. So you can watch the water here. Oh, yeah, turn the. You, well, you're going to get some street noise, too. But. See how the water is coming? Pulling away from this, where it was eroding. This is low flow. At high flow, it does the same thing. So logs, rocks, placed in the right position, rebuilding the bank. Oh yeah, it does. I've seen it go over the bank, but it's flooded over the bank several times. The logs are there. Sometimes it might wash out some of that. I mean, it's still young, okay? It's I'm not saying it's not going to change or it's hard, but in the right conditions, it, over time it's going to rebuild the bank. Here's an aerial view. You can see the old and the new now, is there a study that says how far apart those logs are supposed to be? No, that's Aaron. It's just, yeah. <laughs> Aaron is his years of experience. Yes. Um, uh, There, it's a good question. It's all about education. Um, Ben's got some handouts. I've got some handouts. It's private property. Okay. Well, actually, in part, you know, we know Ben's expertise is in plants and if you know or see something or you know somebody who lives there, there are people who can provide information. And there are nice plants that could be planted. You could plant native flowers. You could plant some nice native bushes with that have color. It doesn't have to be what most people see as autumn olive or something. It doesn't have to be something ugly. But you have to be aware of what you're doing. And even think about it. Somebody buys a house along Paint Creek, it's mowed, they're going to mow it again. And they never saw the erosion because the erosion hap the erosion they see is different than the erosion somebody else saw. And over so many years, it just happened. So it's a good question. It's, it's education. So uh, here's another vein in another. This was a pond-like area. And I, I want you to focus in on this tree and this rock because of the as the pictures go, you need a point of reference. So this was a low water kind of period, and the next one's a low water period. But um, you can see some silt building up there. This the, the creek was really low when I took this picture, but still you can see the log is kind of half buried. And this is a picture I took this year. So, um, so remember, all that water that was out here is being pushed to here. Creek's getting deeper, it's digging out the bottom. The deeper it is, the cooler it is. 
and the more the fish like it. All that shade too. Yeah, and protecting all those shade trees and things. Even on an outside bend. Yeah. Oh, that log is just keeping that area. Well, the log now is, it's, yeah, it's done. It initiated, it initiated the buildup. Yeah, I'm sure it would help over, yeah. Less likely for it to carve that out again. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, this was another area, this is in Dinosaur Hill, okay. Not a great picture, but you can see what the water was low, but we're again, we're building up silt along the bank. Now, as a trained scientist, I like to prove what we're doing is working. So there's this process called electroshocking, where you go in and actually shock the fish with electricity. It doesn't hurt them, but they float to the surface for a second. You can collect them, count them, measure them, throw them back, and they're okay. So to prove or to see what impact our work is having on these areas where we do the work, we do a fish population study before we do the work and after we do the work. Without data, you're just another opinion. So this is how you electroshock. There's a little barge, and, and Trout Unlimited and Kristen runs this show. Uh, there's Kristen there again. Um, got a generator on it, uh, converts AC to DC. These are electric probes that go in the water, and everybody's got their nets, and as the fish float to the surface, you net them and collect them, and you throw them in a cooler. There's another picture of, and with those probes, you can get really into the, nooks and crannies where they like to hide. Nowhere where you're ever get a fly without losing it, but <laughs> you can try. Um, so then we collect the fish in a cooler and every like 10 or 15 minutes, because we don't want to keep them there too long. We take them out, we clip the tail fin, doesn't hurt them, but we mark them as caught. And there's a reason for that, a statistical reason for that, that I'll ex explain. Um, so we mark them as caught, measure them, Throw them back. Oop. Okay. So the reason we mark them is to get a statistically correct or more accurate number of how many fish there are. You go through the section. It's a th we usually do a thousand foot section so we can normalize the data. We catch all we can. We mark them. Throw them back. And the, it's best to go back the next day and do it over again. And you see how many of the first ones that you snipped you caught and how many you catch that didn't have a snip. And when you get two numbers, the statistics are more accurate of how many fish are in the area. So this is, the DNR helped us out in 22 and we did this study. So in Dinosaur Hill, we found 67 brown trout. And in the uh, condo area, we found 94. But what's really cool about this is remember I told you that the DNR stocks the fish between five and six inches. We had 20 fish under five inches. That means they're naturally reproducing. They had one in Dinosaur Hill. This is this is a better area because it, it has more twists and turns and things. Dinosaur Hill is a little bit of a straight shot, so it's not quite as good a, an area for the fish. But um, anyway, that's, yeah. Of the year, yeah, the only year for three inches. Before. Yeah, brown trout, German browns. That was kind of when I was growing up. What they called German browns was I thought was like, that's what they are native species. Well, they, well, they, well, they, well, they were brought over from Germany in the 1800s. They were, they were actually introduced. Yeah. yeah, they were all introduced here yes. in Michigan first and then it's, spread through all the country. Uh, Cleo has done other studies, he hasn't released the data yet. They take, you can take a, a fish scale and it's like it, not an otolith. The otolith is the, the thing in the ear, right? Yeah, no, they, I did work with otoliths, but um, um, they take the scale 
And you can count the rings on a scale just like you count the rings on a tree and get an idea of age. So uh, Cleo did the, um, oh, an otolith is a bone in the fish's ear that also has rings and you can take it out and count the rings and see how old it is. So. And the fish can't hear it. Yeah. Well, it's a little invasive. It's a little invasive, but it tastes good. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's working. So this is a chart, but Cleo hasn't released all the data yet, but he's, he gave us this little piece of information. This, this dotted line here is the average number of fish found in all the streams in Michigan that are the size of Paint Creek. So the condo area is way above that number. And Dino Hill is just above that number. So that's pretty darn good for a stream that's located in this urban area. And Joe, is that trout per acre or per hundred feet? He, per that's per acre. He normalized this data in, in okay. his I stuff. Understand. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I want you to look at something here, though. Lincoln Road. It's below the average. I'll circle back to that the in a minute. The other thing to highlight, Joe, too, is the uh, Ando and Dino Hill sites for the phase one and phase two areas. Gun Road and Teakin Road at the time of this sampling had not yet experienced any habitat improvement. No, we hadn't done any work in those areas. So you can, I mean, it jumps right off the page at how the areas with the improved habitat had how many years? So five years was the uh, first ones went in in 18. 18. Yeah, we did the, we did the, had to get the permits and everything in 17. 18, I think, was the work. Yes. Uh, so it's the, Average number of trout found in streams the same size. Is that cold water streams? I'm assuming so. That I, I, do, I, can't, I don't know that. No, otherwise, it doesn't tell me much. Yeah, I, 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 I cold water streams where trout could survive. Yeah, yeah. I, right. No, and that might be a typo on my part. No, no, Wait, no just, a, just a question. Yeah, it. no, I think I it's cold. I assume it's cold water, but I got to get Cleo's report and it's caught up in bureaucracy reviews right now. So I think that that. Cleo only does fish shopping where they do um, planning. Oh, okay. Fish. Yeah. So it, it would have to be in cold water. They okay. Put Good point. In warm yeah. water. Um, so in 2023, we did what we called phase three. Now we're rolling. We got this figured out. <laughs> Okay, and we did a section between Dutton Road and Tinkin Road. And if you walk the creek or the walk the trail, there's a section of the creek that's straight as an arrow. And it's not very deep and there's no hab there's no very little habitat in there. And our speculation over a beer is that maybe the railroad decided they didn't want to build any more bridges and just decided to straighten the creek out at that point. We're not sure. But it wasn't in good shape. So we decided to, even if it's not perfect habitat long-term for the trout, it's in between a bunch of really good habitats. So we wanna make it better for them to be able to move around. So it's this section right here, um, not just above Tinkin Road. Um, we did that this summer. And it's 1800 feet. Um, and um, we had to get approval from several private landowners to do this work because the creek throat flows through their properties. Um, so, uh, yes, but eventually persistence in education turns them, but it takes time. And, and they have legitimate Questions. I, I I don't mind the question. I'll take any question. Right. Uh, if I can't answer the question, then it's my problem, not their problem. So I don't look at that as a negative, but it does take some work. And I'm. Is there anybody here? Well, I don't want to know yet. Okay. Um, so funding. For the last phase, we got a, a very nice grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, Orvis Royal Oak donated some money. Uh, of course, we raised money. Clinton Valley chipped in some money, and then another local chapter of TU also gave us some money. So the total cost of phase three was $18,000, and there was about 
390 volunteer hours. But phase three, that 1800 feet was equal to both phase one and phase two together. So it was a, a much bigger section. Well, it was, we did it all at once rather than over several years. Yeah. You're putting logs from the shoreline. Where's the 18,000 going? Is it steel rods? And the rods, steel rods are very expensive. Um, permitting is $1,000. Uh, and Aaron doesn't work for free. Aaron doesn't work for free. And to be honest with you, we need young volunteers, and I'll show you why. Okay. We try and make information public. If you were even a social member of Trout Unlimited, you'd get emails about when we're shocking, when we're doing all the studies, when we're doing work, when we're having lectures like this. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I, I'm going to put a plug in and join the club and you'll you'll find out about this all the time. But um, we'll also just to that point, though, we're undertaking um, uh, a total uh, rollout of our social media platforms. And uh, we're hoping to have that uh, late spring, like well, actually early spring on April, uh, adding Instagram, uh, a public Facebook page. Um, that sort of thing. So we're we're hoping, um, you know, that this year we'll be able to roll out a, a better platform, a series of platforms to better engage the community. Nice. And yeah, you know, Ben and I have been talking about this. I'm gonna, I'm sure if I asked him to post a notice or something that, I mean, it's all part of stewardship, right? And Tom Carell up at the Pantry Carroll Commission has posted these kind of things. So we're we're not trying to hide anything. It's just and part of the issue is we have to do them during the week. Because the the trail is busy on weekends and we're we drive a truck up the trail carrying deer um, and things like that. So that makes it a little hard for certain people to come. Anyway, so phase three. What did phase three look like before we did any work? It's basically a lazy river uh, with several pond-like up areas upstream from three major log jams. So you've seen that picture before. You can see no move. It's moving, but it's a lazy river, right? There's another picture of it in the summer, kind of a low water time. Just and here's a couple more pictures. It's moving, but you wouldn't. As a trout fisherman, you wouldn't go in there. You might go in there for panfish or something, but uh, there's another picture of it, right? So not real attractive as a trout stream. There were three log jams in the area. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, why are they removing the log jams if they're putting logs in the creek, okay? Well, part of the problem is, is a log jam stops the flow and there's a, oftentimes the upstream side forms a pond and um, this year in those ponds, for example, we found in one of them two two foot long northern pike that love to eat trout, okay? <laughs> so you start getting a different species in there. Not that northern pike are bad, but it's not, if you're trying to manage this as a trout fishery, uh, northern pike should be in the pond or in Lake Orion or something. Um, and also, when it slows down, it it's less airy. It's just a different environment. It's it, it's a different than than a moving stream. So what we try and do is thin out the dams so you leave as much wood as you can, yet allow a little more flow through the dams. So there's one dam, two dams. That's another dam we thinned out, and that's a third dam we had to thin out. So you can imagine us in there with chainsaws. How much of that is sal salvageable to use in your structure? A lot. Yeah. This year we used a lot of it. Otherwise, we probably couldn't have gotten enough logs off the edge of the that section of the creek. But as I said, we tried to keep as much as we can. The other problem sometimes with these log jams is water is powerful, and it'll find its way around the jam, and now you're making the stream even wider again. So uh, we try and keep the flow to the center of the stream. Uh, again, a lot of help from Kristen 
and her Michigan TU, she brought down three summer interns. We had a guy from Wyoming, uh, a woman from uh, Lake Superior State, and I, I forget what the third kid was. Michigan State. Michigan State. Um, it was great experience for them. I mean, these these they're studying this stuff. And when you see the work we did, it's like three or four classes worth of actual hands-on work. Um, Aaron and brought down two people with him. The Clinton River Watershed staff helped out this year. They have a bunch of new staff members there, and this was new to them, so they jumped in. And then we had volunteers from the Vanguard and Clinton Valley chapters. And there's some rowdy group there for the elect electroshocking in one day. So, um, and here's the core, here's the muscle behind the project here. Uh, this is Kristen, that's Aaron. Those are the three interns and those were two guys that I, uh, Aaron hired. One is his son. <laughs> teach him what hard work was, uh, I think, as he went off to Michigan State. But there's the, and there's our canoe, of course, in the background. One thing we did this year, um, Aaron had six extra uh, temperature loggers. So he let, he let us use them. And so we put uh, three temperature loggers in phase three, and then we put two above phase three and one below phase three, just to see what the temperature was, just curious. Um, and as I said earlier, above 68 degrees, the brown trout start to be stressed. At 72, they shouldn't be fished. Uh, the mean temperature in July this year was 67.6. So that's pretty good, actually. And there's the temperature logger tied with a onto a, a just a log in the stream. So we put them in, in in the early in the season and come back two or three months later. They're like a little computer. Every 15 minutes, they take the temperature and store it. And then Aaron takes them and downloads the data, and we get the data. Now, are these uh, temp loggers, are they permanent additions to the uh, stream, or is that something? We pulled them already. Okay. We we pulled them in the fall. Um, half the problem is finding them again. <laughs> we took pictures of where they were, and even then we're going, where the hell is that logger? <laughs> but anyway. So this is all stoppable. Sorry, I'll see. Dolphin definitely is off. Take a look. Taking too long. Yeah, so that's not cold water. It is. It's always part of the next phase. Yeah. They're working their way upstream. Yeah. Oh, well. well. My real question was, would it be easier for you guys to work with uh, Ben and, and those parks than to have to work with owners, uh, private owners? I guess. Sure, it would be. If but there's any. It's kind of going on. If, well, it's kind of going up. Upstream. We're trying to take the locations that need the most work first. Oh, okay. And then it's also helpful if it's easier to get a permit for a longer section. Like a, an individual homeowner can get a, an eagle permit. So if they called up Aaron and said, hey, we want to do some stuff in front of our house on our land, Aaron can go down and get them an individual permit. But for us to get individual permits for shorter sections is a lot more work. So we like to take a bigger section and knock it out. So there's a lot of factors in there. Yeah, the permit is the same whether it doesn't matter. It just it just saves. I, I go to Ben. He goes to the township. I'd like to give these guys permission. They sign a permission slip and it's done. Individual homeowners got to mail a letter to each one and and get their permission. Of course, we did the electroshocking. Now, we electroshock a thousand foot section. We only found seven brown trout in this section of the creek um, versus the sixty or. 80 that we got down lower there. So there's not much fish in this section, but it'll be interesting to see what the future brings. One was a beauty though, 16 incher in a deep pool. So they're in there. The other thing we did this year, which is new for us is a geomorphic survey. A geomorphic survey is measuring the, um, the character of the, the creek, how, how deep it is, how wide it is and things like that. 
So you can see it basically, and this is Kristen and her team and her interns did a geomorphic survey. Thousand foot section is a tape measure you can barely see, the survey equipment measuring the creek across the distance. So we, we have a profile of the, the yeah, creek. We'll actually using a rope, will actually create the problem. Yeah, yeah, the, the rope make, the, 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 they'll do this. They'll tell us whether it's this or this. And we're gonna go back to the same sections a few years from now and see if the profile changed. Without data, you're just another opinion. I have no idea. Kristen, <laughs> Kristen worked her magic there. But she had done this already in the upper. I'm sorry, you have a question? No, they, they do a pro, substrate profile, which we call a pebble count. And I didn't put this in that slide, but they do a pebble count across the, the same section to see whether there's big rocks, little rocks, sand, muck, whatever. And they also see if that changed. Um, this, this is an example. Kristen did this on the upper Manistee. Um, and uh, the first measure she took was the triangles in 21. And then she took it again in 23. And look at this went from about 78 feet wide to 58 feet wide. So it moved the side of the bank in 20 feet. Um, and look at the depth profile versus the original one. So uh, we took this section. This is before vein installation. Nice section of creek. There's an undercut bank there, but it's it's gonna it's putting pressure on those trees and things. So we decided to put a couple veins in there. All right, you ready for this? Who's volunteering to go install veins in 25? All right, here you go. 61 logs, 122 spikes. Anybody count how many blows? Depends whether it's the first day or the last day. <laughs> so, um, so we put that's this is the log actually here, uh, and there's a vein up here. There's a vein up here. We're trying to push the creek more towards the center. We also put an in-stream log right here. So uh, that's where you'd probably throw your fly, right? <laughs> Um, this is this was the bottom. This was the last log we could put in in our permitted section. The point of this log was to push the water away from this bank. You can see it pushing to cut down on the erosion. Of course, we put a bunch of in-stream logs in different pools and stuff along the way under some bushes. Did you anchor those down too with the spikes? Everything's anchored with the spikes. Every one of them, 61 of them. <laughs> um, what? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say 10 inches. So this was a picture of one of the log jams before being thinned out. That's after being thinned out. But we left a lot of, still a lot of habitat in there. All right, Kristen, not only the brains, but some of the brawn. <laughs> But I don't know why Aaron's wearing a hard hat for this. But <laughs> <laughs> you can hear the drill going in the background. They're drilling holes in another log. It's an all day affair. So here's an impact of a double vein. You can see up above it's calm. And then down below it's channeled that water to the center. Um, single vein impact kind of pushing it to the center again. I'm, I'm taking more time than I expected, but you ever think about using a fence pole uh, uh, driver? And, uh, we tried that, and it didn't work. Um, not enough, not enough. I don't you think it was enough. Air, air. You just get a gas powered. Well, there you go, driver. So this this will be the first season. You better not charge us more. <laughs> We drilled up earlier. I showed you we have a drill, like a, just a 
No, we have an electric drill. We have a little generator that we carry in the canoe. Nope, nope. This is a interesting picture. So about two or three weeks after we put all our structures in, it was the hundred year flood. Which you know, a hundred year flood means it's only there's a one percent chance it happens once a year, but you could get three of them in a row, right? So hundred years doesn't mean every hundred years. But it's it's kind of look at all the dirt that build up behind that log. That log isn't gonna go anywhere. So it's pinned down, plus now it's getting built up, and you can see the scour pool starting at the lower edge. The other thing, so you can see the scour pool, the riffles, the movement. And the other, see, see down river here? Oh, you got that center channel now and you got movement in the water. Remember the pictures I showed you before? It was nothing. The other thing that's really cool about this is now you can hear the creek. Did you hear that? Isn't that cool? And that's aerating and, and other positives for the, the creek itself. Now, I told you every every section I have a favorite vein, so I got to show my, this is my favorite vein. Um, and um, we're trying, the water is coming down this edge here, so we're trying to push it here. Aaron got artistic and put another thing in there, but tell me you wouldn't throw a fly into this. Here we go. And look downstream, look at what it looks like now, going downstream. This is a double vein. I gotta show you again, this is a little lower water, my favorite vein, you have to. It's, it's a little quieter, but still, it's still doing its job. And I'm telling you, if you go in behind those logs, it's perfectly calm down at the bottom. Fish just hiding there and they wait for food to come over the logs. Right? No, no, no. This is something that's too cold. No, it's just this is too too shallow in certain places, and uh, too yeah. many veins. Yeah, too many veins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So again, I want to remind you, this is phase three before the Vanguard project. <clears throat> and there it is after, you can see the center flow. And so we put those double veins all the way down everywhere we could to keep that center flow through the whole section. Here's another picture looking downstream of a center flow and you can see what it's doing, the double vein. So we got phase four planned. Uh, target date is 2025. Uh, we have to get the money together and the permitting and the homeowner permission uh, in 2024 in order to do the work in 2025. And the section we chose is below phase three uh, and above phase one and two, so we can connect the whole the whole thing. It's also a section that the DNR has been doing population studies on for many many years. So we not only have a history, and I'll show you something here. And remember what I, I told you on that other slide of Aaron's, the blue Tinkin Road, it's below the average. Uh, look, here's an interesting history. Maybe it goes back to Gallagher Creek or something. I don't know. Here's the history of the DNR's shocking of um, that section of Paint Creek. So it peaked in 2006, yeah, 10. And in 2022, this is where it was. But Aaron had mentioned that there wasn't as many uh, logs in the stream because remember, if it's natural logs, they can continue to be flushed downstream. So they're not permanent. And the banks looked a little wider to him over time. So the end result of this, this is kind of cool, is that when we're done, um, the, the yellow highlighted area is the section that Vanguard and the Trout Unlimited chapters have improved and it's about a mile. And the blue highlight, if you guys don't know, maybe you do, but the city of Rochester did a lot of work in their park to improve the habitat of the park. And that's the blue line. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, the work that the uh, city of Rochester did, did they not also contact Aaron? Yeah, Aaron did a lot of the work down there. Yeah. 
So we'll have improved this almost entire section uh, all the way down to the Clinton River. Not quite all the way. I think the town, the, the city's work stopped at the library or thereabouts, I think. Um, but both, all these areas are densely populated. Um, private land, subdivisions, condos, a nature preserve, commercial buildings. And we're, we're kind of uh, protecting the, or improving the place that gets kind of the most action, you know, of all kinds of activity. You go farther up the creek, things happen, but it's farmland. It's, it's not as densely, you know, impacted. So there are local resources for more information. And if you own property along the creek and would like to learn more, you can contact Ben. Um, for advice on native plantings, you can plant to help stabilize your stream bank. You can contact Aaron and I, we have his information if you wanted to do work on your own in front of your, your, your area. Michaela Dean is the new watershed ecologist at Clinton River Watershed Council. She also has information on stream bank maintenance. So there are resources available, public resources for people to learn more and figure out what to do if, if they, uh, of course, you can always get involved with Trout Unlimited. Um, how can you support our Paint Creek work? If you live in the Hillside Creek subdivision, they have a commons area. We need your permission to do phase four work. So I don't know if anybody's online or in the room here, but please, if we could get your permission, that would be great. Um, and of course, we always need help funding and you can make a tax deductible donation to us um, on our website through PayPal. You can write a check or you can see me afterwards if you have access to other money, donor advice funds or anything like that. But we're all self funded. I mean, we're a charity just doing this work. And you can see it's really cost effective. You're not going to get a lot of this work done anywhere else for that kind of money. Any final questions? Yes. What made you choose the bottom end versus the top end with cold water inlet? Because it was the worst conditions for habitat. Bottom. On the group, the worst first. Yeah. Work your way up to Lake Boyd. Yep. Yep. Work. Have you done all the fish shockings for the whole 15 mile? No. No. Again, we got limited resources. Um, I've always heard down city that I walk in stretch the lake. Solar belt doesn't look like that. Or that you can even get in the water. Yeah. Because of how narrow, how shallow, or how much woody debris, natural woody. Yeah, I, I, they don't, um, here. You know, a lot of it goes so here's where they here's where they stock the fish. So they they stock the fish at Adams Road, <clears throat> Clarkson Kern Road, Rochester City Park, Pinkin Road, and I don't know where Village Park is. That must be in Lake Orion or something. Yeah, it's almost at, at where it comes over the dam. Maybe the, oh, okay, a couple hundred so in downtown. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's where the children's. Uh, okay, is. so that's that's where they put the fish in. I don't. But I asked Cleo one time. I said, "Where do they go?" He goes, "I don't know. Wherever they want." <laughs> so you don't know where they're going up and down. But um, I mean, you could probably fish that. It's going to be harder. You got to have a smaller rod. You got to, you know, you got a lot of trees and stuff. Um, this is the the sections that we're doing are 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 the most popular for fishing. They get a lot of pressure, um, but they. They're fish in there. You saw that 16 incher. So it's all artificial lure. No. Oh, oh, our artificial lure. Yeah. Where, where does that start? Thinking the gun. Yeah. Thinking the gun is artificial. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for coming on this. Co oh, Ben. I have a question online. Um, someone on the chat wants to know. They'd love to volunteer, um, but they're not part of the club. Where can they find more information? 
At this point, probably vanguardtu.org, which is our website. Um, at, at that website, uh, they can um, click on the directors and uh, reach out to me via email, Paul Paskey. Uh, I think Joe's email is on there as well. Um, and then, like I said, uh, hopefully by uh, spring of 2024, we'll have a more robust uh, social media presence where we'll be able to push out um, activities and upcoming events so forth uh, by people following us on Instagram or Facebook. Okay, vanguardtu.org. Yeah, vanguardtu.org. You don't have to be a member. We'd like everybody to be a member because it helps fund the work in a small way. But if you're just interested in in getting notices, like I have a friend of mine who gets notices because his Boy Scout troop is interested in maybe doing some work. If you have uh, kids in high school who need honor society credits, they can come do work. I mean, we'll, especially for the shocking or for the geomorphic surveys or or any of that kind of stuff, we we will take people. So if you want to give us your email, we'll put you on the distribution list. Right now we have a newsletter that goes out and just tells people, but you're going to get when our meetings are and, and all those kind of things too. We're working on making that a little better. Is there a training required for training? Weightlifting for, <laughs> for the site. No, there's no training. Um, it's on the job training. Okay. Yeah. Yes, all the rainbow. I didn't talk about rainbows. There's a lot of rain rainbow trout in Pan Creek also, um, but those are baby steelheads. And um, I I don't know how well they interact. The bigger problem that a lot of people aren't aware of is that. Yates Dam, everybody's been to Yates Dam and had cider and donuts and everything. There's a breach around Yates Dam. Um, because of that, it now is the risk of lamprey going beyond Yates Dam into Upper Clinton in the Paint Creek. So um, there is money already available through the US Fish and Wildlife Service to fix the breach. But the breach is on property owned by a company in Germany, and they haven't given permission for people to go on the property to make the fix. If you can believe that. My understanding too is they originally did fix the breach, and then it broke. Yeah, again. yeah they fixed it once, and then it it broke again. So they have another plan to make more serious. I, I assume to correct what they didn't do. So the city of Rochester Hills is working on this. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is working on it with this company in Germany to get their permission to make the fix. But um, it's a it's a real risk. We haven't seen any lamprey in our studies yet, but it could happen. There has been two lamprey. The uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, they did treat the creek about about seven eight years ago. They found uh, seeing that first. Oh, really? Yeah. And Ben, when did they? When did you see him treating the creek? The last couple of years. So they've been back again since then to treat the creek. Yeah, when we did the uh, bug jam survey, we surveyed the whole creek, Lake Orion down to the park, and uh, located uh, GPS coordinates where every bug jam was. And then with the, the four different chapters of the uh, Trout Unlimited plus the DNR and Flint River Watershed Council, we we picked different logging that we took out of the six months team. But when we were doing that, we ran into the uh, fishers and wildlife. And at that time, they were dumping in the dye to see how it flowed. They were coming back the next week to do it. Jeff is former president of our chapter, so mm -hmm. a lot of history there too. Isn't it easier to put in a here? See lamprey? It's easier to block the breach. And the money's available. It's not a question of money. It's not a question of design. It's a question of permission. So I, mean, I don't know what they've done in Washington. 
talking to senators or congressmen about this company, but they used to own Letica. And then they sold the building to the Rochester uh, school system, public schools, but they kept some of the property. And that's where the breach is at. So these are the things that it's 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 amazing what you learn about maintaining this really unique resource that we have. Um, and that's where I want to maybe should have circled back to. Paint Creek is really unique. To have a cold water stream with brown trout fishing, naturally reproducing in this area, this, this really densely populated area is really unique. It should be an asset that is protected and talked about as part of living in this area. And it's just sometimes I think taken for granted. Thank you very much. I kept you longer than the plan. <laughs>